Assalamu alaikum to you all. Can you hear me loudly and clearly? Yes, we can. Well, I can. Alaikum as Yes, sir. All right, that's a good start. Uh, let's get the introductions in so that we can get started. Senior Executive Instructor Habiba Abdul Shahid in Camden, New Jersey. Assalamu alaikum, Amir Alameen, Southfield, Michigan. Assalamu alaikum, Ezekiel Abdullah, Senior Instructor Ezekiel Abdullah from Atlanta, Georgia. You got Kareem Hassan from Cleveland, Ohio. Assalamu alaikum, Sophia from Bermuda. Donald Craig from San Francisco, California. All right, once again, I give you the greetings of peace, the greetings that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. Salamu alaikum to you all. And I'm going to go right from my notes so that we can get started. This is the abbreviated letters class session number seven. I am your international instructor, Benjamin Bilal. And we have a lot to go over this evening. Thank you all for being here and for being on time. All right, let's get a quick confirmation that you can see my notes on the screen. Yes, sir. Wonderful. Yes, sir. On a moment. Hmm. Still letting people in here. All right, so let's begin at the beginning with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim with Allah's signature, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. And as we go deeper into the explanation and understanding of the zodiacal signatures, uh, I believe that you're understanding even better now what I mean when I say that Bismillah can also refer to the signatures, beginning with the signatures of Allah or the signature of Allah, which Allah has impressed upon every single thing created. Everything that has been created by Allah bears his imprint as a signature 
everything that has been created based on false manufacturing has the signature of that particular creator, if you will, small c, upon its character, its disposition, and its function. So this is how you know the clear distinctions between what Allah has created as fitrah and what men's minds have fabricated and introduced into the world as their fitrah. Whatever Allah has done, Allah says that Satan has sought to seek its duplicate. So it's about understanding the differences in the duplications. And most people's eyes can't tell the difference between the real paperwork and the fabricated faxed over facsimile version. You have to look real close at a fax to know that it's a copy of an original. Allah holds the patent for all things original in his fitrah, whereas other minds come along and begin to seek to duplicate the original, and then they put their stamp of approval. In fact, some of them even put patents <laughs> on their creations and um, introduce them into the world as though there's something that all of us should admire and utilize, and that's not always the situation. So we have to be very careful what we're partaking in and of when it comes to man-made creation and feel safe as you need to feel participating in Allah's creation. So today we're going to be talking about the significance of the sun and moon in the psychology of the zodiac. The sun and the moon in the psychology of the zodiac. And we're still talking about the abbreviated letters, keeping in mind that all of the abbreviated letters are representative of uh, zodiacal signatures. From Aries all of the way to Pisces, there are 12 distinct signatures. And the abbreviated letters in the Quran are also speaking to that phenomenon. It's not speaking only to that phenomenon, but it is speaking mostly and mainly to that phenomenon. So pay very careful attention. You will not be understanding all of this out the gate. You won't be understanding all of, you'll never understand all of something that's newly introduced to you. Just like a child who has information being newly introduced to its intellect, it's not going to understand not even simple things like the ABCs. You have to repeat them over and over again to the child. Numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, whichever way you're teaching them to count. You have to, as simple as it might seem to us, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging for the average child to be able to pick up on the rhythm of it, to uh, the sequencing of it, et cetera. So it's the same thing with learning these zodiacal signatures that some are calling the zodiac. You won't get it just because you've heard it once or twice. You have to actually commit your brain to learning its sequences and the connections and the logic of each one of these abbreviated letters. There are 14 of these abbreviated letters in the Quran representing 12 of the zodiacal signatures. And that is because two of the signatures are actually the same sound, such as calf and off. Okay, so that's why you're going to have duplicates. But in total, when you understand that those two are dis given as distinct and separate letters, as abbreviated letters, then you'll understand that there are not only 12, there are 14 in the sequencing of the letters in the Quran, but there are only 12 signatures represented in total. I hope that's understood. So again, today, Sunday, March 5th, 2023, we're going to be talking about the significance of the sun and moon in the psychology of the zodiac. Now. Instructors, keep this in mind. When I give you information and I give you particular terminology such as sun and moon, such as zodiac, don't go off into la-la land with that. Don't go off into new world or new age stuff and all of the stuff you've been hearing off of these new age sites. I'm not talking new age. I'm talking al Quran. I'm talking about a book that Imam Muhammad called the promised reading, meaning a, an understanding of the Quran that was to come. It wasn't here yet. Okay. So when you hear these strange terms or strange ideas 
they were only strains in your brain. They're not strains to the Quran. The Quran has a chapter called the zodiacal signs, al-buruj, the zodiacal signs. The Quran encourages us to study the stars. It mentions the great star Sirius. Hmm? There's a Sirius A and there's a Sirius B. Most people don't know that because schools do not encourage us to study the heavens as they're called. They don't encourage us to study the signatures that Allah has placed all throughout this galaxy and throughout the maybe multiple universes that are in existence. We don't know. We're still studying. So these things are, are put in the Quran. As you know, there's a surah called the sun. There's a surah called the moon. Here's where you have to go in order to understand what Instructor Bilal is leading you to. You don't go to the sci-fi way out, you know, new world and new age people for what I'm talking about. You take these terms and you look first and foremost in the Quran to see if the Quran is discussing these terms. You say, does the Quran discuss the sun? If so, what's the term for that in the Quran, the Arabic term? And I know some of you out there know. Some of, one of you can open up your phones and, and tell me what the Arabic word in the Quran is for the sun. Ashams. Very good. And while you're there, give me the Arabic term for the moon. Uh, um, Kamar. Kamarun. Say it again. Kamar. Kamarun. Yes. Al Kamar. That's right. Q A M A R. And while you're all there, give me the term for the stars. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> the old nation of Islam people, which is sun, moon, and star. You should have known this uh, like 70 years ago. <laughs> if you were here. Najim, what is it? Najim? Najim. That's right. You got it. Najim. Yeah. Nujum. Or Najim, the star. And Najim, the star. That's right. All right. So somebody give me those three back to back if you can. In our sun is the sun, moon is. I'm, I'm, I don't think I've spelled that right. Try it Kuma. anyway. Okay. Kuma. Kuma. Yeah. Kuma. Kamar. Okay. Kamar. And it's related to the, it's related to the name Kumar, but Kamar. Q A M A R. Yes. Okay. And, and stars, stars is not true. Very good. And is a server by that name. Okay. No, I was saying that there's uh, there's also a surah that speaks to the stars also. In fact, in several places in the Quran, it highlights the stars. And it tells you in one place that the sun, the moon, or the star are meant to be worshipped. But it is only Allah that is deserving of that level of dedication and devotion. All right. So now that we're clear on that, let's continue to move on. Make sure you mute your phones unless you want to ask a question or make a comment. Feel free. Now, the sun, as we have said on many occasions, and I first learned this from Imam W.D. Muhammad, that the sun is a symbol of social logic. And social logic is the knowledge that's necessary for advancing society forward as a collective. So there is the individual in society, and then there is the collective body of people called the social group of people in any given society. We call them a collective. The Quranic Arabic word, ikra, which all of us are familiar with, it means not to read, not as a first meaning. It means to collect. And the collecting is in reference to the harvest that the agriculturalist was familiar with. The agriculturalist had determined and established that the growth of vegetation, the growth of fruits and vegetation was primary on the list of things necessary for survival. For survival. The people that went out to capture animals, what they call game or big game, like buffalo and deer and all of those things that they had to chase down, that wasn't the first uh, prompting in the human intellect towards survival. The first prompting was to find those things that you could eat that you didn't have to chase down. <laughs> they were easily recognizable and accessible. So early humans were actually hunter-gatherers yes but they were gatherers before they became hunters 
they were gatherers. And when they became not as satisfied with the things that they were gathering, the, the you know, the berries and, the, you know, the fruits off the tree and the vegetation out of the gardens, when they became dissatisfied with that, as the human intellect is prone to do, it becomes dissatisfied and wants bigger and better as time accrues. So they began to devise schemes that would allow them to catch some of the smaller animals and uh, eventually some of the bigger animals. Now, the interesting thing about the bigger animals is that for gathering fruits and vegetables and maybe even for catching possum or some of those smaller animals or rabbit or something like that, it didn't take a troop of people to do that. It didn't take groups of people to do that individuals could trap a rabbit or a possum or some smaller animal, but it took two, three, or more men to capture big game, like bison, buffalo, you know, those kinds of things that could feed many, many families, not just your individual family. If you caught it, it could feed the entire tribe, probably with some left over. All right. So, that phenomenon in and of itself is speaking to the nature of nature in how nature herself is creating and developing and fostering and encouraging the social nature in the human being to become activated. Because if I have to get Jimmy, Bob, and Steve to help me wrestle, wrestle this animal down or to shoot the spear at it or the arrow at it or throw the spear at it or whatever, or to develop the bear trap, or, you know, and if I have to depend on two or three and other grown men or young men with muscle to be able to capture that game in order for our families to eat, then that participation and cooperation on the part of other people along with me to capture that animal so that we can share the spoils, no pun intended, right? Then it's the participation that is growing the social nature in these groups, see? So if you want bigger and better, become more social is the underlying message. So the sun is a symbol of that progression. The sun allows us to see all of the people and the places and the things in our environment. The sun introduces us to a world of nouns, person, place, thing, right? The sun is doing that introducing our eyes and acclimating our ears and the things that we touch, reach out and touch and feel and study. The sun is allowing us to do that, not the moon. The sun is allowing us to do that. So that's how the sun became a symbol of social logic because once we grew an understanding of what this particular thing signified and can be used for, practically used for, then we developed a particular logic for what it was we were then participating in as creation. Whether it was the tribe that we just got to know who were living on the other side of the river, we developed a practical way of interchanging with them. We began to understand that if we bring them some of what we have that they don't have, we could exchange it for some of what they have that we don't have, see? Even exchange, fair exchange, no thievery, right? So we became more social and the human nature became more civilized because of that exchange. So the development of the human being's social nature has to do with something called exchange. That's what being social is, exchange. And I told you that the word social was simply the words of soul shell. It's the shell or the covering or the protection for your soul. Being social is what is protecting the integrity of your soul. It's not your relationship with the source creator that's protecting your soul. Some people's relationship in their own minds with their source creator is what's responsible for them being that crap cuckoo. Some of them think they're talking to God and that he's talking back to them. Before you know it, they got a space helmet on and they're running around their living room in their, you know, in their, in their, uh, in their drawers, thinking that they're communicating with some divine being or some divine power. 
and you'll be visiting them in the psych ward soon because of their personal relationship with God. We got preachers out here preaching in church that think they have a personal relationship with God that you don't have. You have to actually come to and through them to reach God. You can't reach him for yourself. You can only reach them through this specially ordained person who himself or herself in this case, is speaking to God for you. See, that's when you begin to go cuckoo, when you begin to think that your relationship with the source creator of all of this phenomenon speaks to you personally and nobody else. <laughs> no. The Quran comes to allow us to know that each one of us as individuals can speak to Allah. But it's not something that only you have privy to. And it's not something that you're going to go into your room into a deep-seated meditation, and then you're going to hear the voice of Allah speaking particularly to you and your concerns. No. You ask Allah for what it is you want, and Allah sends you the signals, the signatures, and the sigils necessary for answering your quest or your dua. It's all around you. The answers are all around you. But if you're not paying attention to the ayat, to the instructions, the instructing signs that Allah has placed around you, and as he says, in you, that most people are not paying attention to, as Allah says in the Quran, if you're not paying attention to those things, you miss the boat. You miss the whole answer that Allah is waiting to give you as soon as you make that dua. You should start debating those senses. Listen more acutely. Look at something more correctly. Pay attention. Don't just look at a thing. Look into the thing. Study the thing. Attempt to understand what's in front of you. Even if you turn on the television, listen to the things that are being said, particularly the first things that are said once you become attuned to that television, that news broadcast, or even a song. Sometimes Allah will send you the answer in a song, in a lyric. But again, if you're not paying attention to the instructing signs, you're going to miss the boat waiting in your room for God to speak to you directly. Hey, 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 it's your turn now. What was that you asked me again? <laughs> See, it doesn't work like that. Allah says, when they ask you concerning me, I am near. I answer the dua of every caller when he calls. How many will answer my call? That's what Allah says. So Allah has a call also, all right? So all of these things are being addressed in the Quran and many of the things that have to do with the construction that we call the human psychic makeup, how you operate inside, spiritually, mentally, morally, motivationally, how you operate on the inside. Most of that is being dealt with through these so-called abbreviated letters. So we spoke about the Aleph Lam meme phenomenon, and we're still on that because there, there's so much to unpack just in those three letters. Aleph Lam meme, so much to unpack. And I told you that Aleph is associated with the signature Aries. Lam is associated with what? Anyone in the audience can answer? Taurus. Taurus. Yes. Very good. And while I got you, the meme is associated with what? Gemini. Gemini. This is so beautiful that y'all are catching on this quick and can just give it back with that kind of confidence. That's wonderful. So yes, Aleph, Aries, Lamb, Taurus, Meme, Gemini, the twins. And uh, you'll notice that in the word meme, there are twin letters. What are they? M. M that's right. If you say, like I'm spelling it, you get the two M's and the two E's. <laughs> yeah, well, the E is an elongation, but I get it. When, if we're talking consonants, though, you know, we're talking just the letter M mm -hmm. stated right. twice, just like in the word for mother. What's that word? Um, mom. In oh. English, yeah, mom with two M's, but in Arabic. Um, um, um. Um. And how do you spell um. that in Arabic letters? U M N. Yep, and what is that you? Uh, wow, what's Dumb, the meaning Dumb. with the shadda? Now, if you're spelling it, what letter would you be using for, for, for that you? If you're spelling it in Arabic. You, uh, you. Good practice, y'all. 
There's no there's no letter U in Arabic. Yes, oh, someone said Alex. Oh, oh, oh. That's right, Alex. Alex. Mm -hmm. With a dumma vowel. With the dumma. Yes, now you got it. All right. Y'all waking up and this And mean is good. with the shadda. Very good. Shadda, which doubles the letter, right? The sound of the consonant. Very good. And dumma so, general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we're seeing that uh, the letter meme is also related to the word for mother in English because we say mom, right? We also use the word ma'am when we answer older women, right? Yes, ma'am, two M, same thing, right? And in Arabic, we have um, which is alif, meme, meme. As Adib said, with the shed that over the meme. So you pronounce the meme twice. So this is very important for us to understand in learning what these uh, letters mean as so-called abbreviated letters. And as I said earlier, these are, not, these are not abbreviated letters. They're not abbreviations for anything. They're the full package, but you have to understand what the letter means. And that's what a lot of scholars have refused to or just did not know to teach us, that each letter in the Arabic letter system in and of themselves have their own unique meaning, but particularly these so-called abbreviated letters are fully uh, loaded and packed and ready to go with what they're attempting to teach you. But you have to be a diligent student. You have to be circumspect. That means you have to be looking around like the camel. You got to be looking in all directions for your answers. And sometimes you got to look up. But you know, most animals can't look up. So we just relegate it to the right and the left. <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah. Uh huh? Now, you said that the I mean was Gemini, it was a twin. So what was the twin letters? That was associated with um, the meme? letter M, the letter meme itself, the two memes, M E E M. And you said there was letters. How about in the um, in the the um, consonant? It's related to consonant. Well, we're talking about the consonant called M or meme. Right. Okay. So, yeah, um, and I was saying was, that. The, mm -hmm. I'm not understanding what your question. The, Okay, the question is, what was the other letter that was a twin to a mean? Do you understand? Is it, no, I don't. We're looking at if, if, if someone else understands what Abdul is saying, we, chime in. A double. I'm not a, a double. Double. It's in the center. All right, so you're not posing the question clear enough for people to understand. I know right. I'm not understanding it's what a, you're asking. It's a double. You mentioned a double. Yes, that's called shed. Yeah, that's called oh, shed. Yeah, so in Arabic, if you put a shedda over a consonant, it doubles the sound of the consonant. In this case, if you pronounce the word for mother, which is um, there's a double M, so you'd have to spell it U-M-M. -M. Is that clear? Oh, got it. Even in the word shedda, there's a shedda over what letter? The D. That's right. Over the dal, so you pronounce the d twice. Shed, that's the first d. Shed, then da. Shed da. S h a d d a. Shed da. So anytime you see a shed that over a consonant, you know to pronounce it twice, like Allah, the l in Allah. See, those are shed das that are placed over those consonants. Okay, so we're gonna move forward. We don't want to get stuck there. But I hope that satisfied you as an answer. Well, that's clear, though, because we have to know to see these little markings, which means a lot. It's significant. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially if you're going to, you know, eventually read and, you know, understand the value of the letter itself. Because when you double something, you strengthen it. And that's what shedda means. It means to strengthen a thing. Not, okay? elong not e elongating. No, no, that's for a vowel. So I'm glad you said that so people will know the difference. And elongation is only for vowels. You can't elongate a consonant. Okay? You can only elongate a, e, u, o, a, e, you know, those kinds of things. You can elongate those, but you can't elongate a consonant per se. You can lengthen the sound of a consonant, but only the consonants N and M. You can just hold on to the reverberation, and, but that's not a vowel because your mouth is connecting. 
Vowels are open mouth that sounds like A, E, I, O, U, you know, that kind of thing. And then what they call a diphthong, a combination of the two vowels, which is what English vowels are. They're not true vowels, they're diphthongs. Arabic with its A, E, O, those are vowels. But A is a combination of the A and the Y sound. See the difference? So although they call them vowels in English, they're not true vowels. They are combinations of vowels called the diphthongs. Look that word up, D-I-P-T-H-O-N-G-S. Let's continue. So we're talking about the sun as a symbol of social logic. The Arabic letter system has what are called sun letters and moon letters, 14 of each. Don't worry about that for now. Just log it, put it in your back pocket for later. 14 sun letters and 14 moon letters. And you can actually investigate that on your own time. All right? But just to let you know that those symbols are in the language construction and structure itself, the sun and the moon. And you mentioned that the word for sun is ashams, and the word for the moon is al qamar, and there's a word for the star also, al najm. So that's in the Quran. So let's begin with the idea of the sun being a symbol of social logic. And if you're not knowing what we mean by social logic, we're talking about the knowledge that is necessary for advancing society forward as a collective. So as I mentioned, the very fact that to bring in bigger game, to bring in bitter, bigger uh, uh, food uh, uh, items and, and uh, uh, objects, you had to form a collective in order to do that. It had to be four and five and sometimes six and 12 <laughs> men on the most part going out to hunt to bring home two and three of those big old animals the bison and the buffalo, et cetera. But the smaller the animal, the less people you would need. And if it was small enough, like a rabbit, as I said, one person can handle that, go out, catch a rabbit, bring it back, so forth. And if you're going to pick vegetables or pick fruits off of trees, individuals could do that. You didn't need a collective group of people to go out and do apple picking. So what I'm saying to you is that the nature of how Allah develops your social instincts and your social intelligence, it's clocked into what Allah forces us to do in the fitrah, beginning with survival needs and then growing from that point to become desires that are not necessarily needs. They're just things that we want and we don't need them to survive but we want them to survive, see? We don't need the bear skin to survive, but we hunt the bear for its meat and its fur, you see? We don't need it. It's not, a, if we don't have it, we ain't gonna die. We could use something else to cover ourselves in the cold, but we want it. So nature moves us from our wants, our basic survival wants and needs, actually not wants, but needs. And then we graduate to the wants, the things that we can do without, but we like it, so we want it anyway, right? So there are the needs, survival needs, and then there are the desires, the wants, the things we just want. All right. So collective is the key word. The Quranic word ikra means to collect, but it means to collect the harvest. It was directed towards people who were familiar with farming and agriculture. That's who this Quran was first revealed to the farmer. Now you might say, well, how was that instructed Bilal when it was revealed to a nomad? You know, it was revealed to a desert dweller, you know, to revealed to someone who only was familiar with the sand and the winds, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of vegetation going on in Mecca. So uh, you're contradicting yourself, instructed Bilal, no? No, I'm not. It was revealed to the agriculturalist. Do you think Allah would have as many agricultural terms and items and produce in the Quran as he has and be revealing that to a people who weren't familiar with agriculture? <laughs> all through the Quran, he's talking about orchards and grapes and pomegranates and all kinds of things and trees and you know and all that. 
Do you think Allah would reveal, would reveal that to a, a person and a group of people who were not familiar with that stuff? That would defeat the whole purpose of the revelation. Allah is giving you this precious information, but you can't even study it because you don't know what that is. <laughs> what's, a, what's a tree, God? You know, what's a, a wet? Uh, what's a grape for God? You know, why are all these things in the Quran? A, 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 a date. Why is he talking to Mary and talking about dates? You know, the fruit, the fig, the olive. The, why is he revealing all these things in the Quran if he was revealing it to a person and a group of people, the ancient nomads, the Arabs of the desert, who were not familiar with produce? So it's not me contradicting myself. It's their fabricated history that is contradicting themselves. Maybe they got it wrong, or maybe they, they taught you wrong. Maybe the people that this Quran originally came to were people of produce and agriculture. I say they were. You have to prove me wrong. The burden of proof is now on you, scholar. Let's continue. So the Arabic word does not mean read, as they've told us, at least not as a first meaning. It only means read if you spell it in English as R-E-E-D, the plant <laughs> that needs to be harvested. But if you're talking about R-E-A-D, no way in the world it could have meant that when Muhammad the prophet received that revelation initially. No way. He didn't have a book. And according to some scholar, they say he couldn't read. I don't believe that one. But he didn't have a book for sure. For the 23 years of his preaching, it was never said of him that he held or carried around a tome, a book, a physical book. All of that was done after the fact, after he passed, after he transitioned, is when the book began to be collected. You get it? The pages of the book, after being written down, were collected and put into one useful, what's called now a mushaf a physical tome or book that came after his passing, not in his lifetime. So Ikra could not have meant that kind of reading. In fact, if you knew or believed that God was telling you to read, what would stop you from learning how to read and you had 23 years to do it? What kind of prophet would you be? You're telling me that you believe that the source creator sent you this message? Ikra? As they put it with an exclamation point at the end, Ikra, read. <laughs> you mean to tell me he had scribes around him who knew how to read, could have taught him how to read, and he didn't take enough time out of his busy prophet schedule to learn how to put letters together to form words so that he could begin really reading as God had instructed him to read? You're saying he wanted to remain unlettered. It's a lot of encouragement for our children and grandchildren, I'll tell you that much, but it's not true. So they can't pin that on the prophet. You have to pin that on the history tellers, the people who tell the history. Now, Ikra means to collect, and it's in reference to the harvest. Ikra is an agricultural term. You see how they built the Arabic word Ikra into agri? It's saying the same thing. Agri is ikra. The G and the Q are interchangeable, as you know. So they took much of the wisdom and the science of linguistics out of the Arabic language and other uh, Asiatic, uh, Afro-Asiatic languages, and they put it in the Arabic language and context. So that prefix agri has to do with ikra, the harvesting of the field. When that harvest is due, not before time, when it's due, all right? So it's an agricultural term. And all of the important ideas in the Quran are given to you within two spectrums. One is agricultural spectrum, and the other one is the commerce spectrum, the exchange of money, finance, That's most of what the Quran is dealing with. If I had to give it to you in terms of the four basic elements, they would be the elements of land and water. 
land represents the agriculture. That's where your businesses develop. From the exchanging of produce that is grown in your field, on your land, in your farm, et cetera, and you sell it to other people's areas. And water. Very often, once you collect your agriculture, if you need to deliver it to people who are a distance away from you, now you have to put it on boats and that kind of thing. So the water becomes an important essential in the um, exchange of agricultural goods across the water, not just across the land. So you see how Allah is gradually expanding the human being's social makeup. He's selling to his immediate tribe. He's selling to his immediate vicinity. Everybody in his area is straight up and down like six o'clock. They're good. They're good to go. They got food. They know when the next harvest is coming in. They prepare for that. But then uh, we know that there are going to be lands and people across the water that we are not familiar with yet. So they have to eat food too. So let's go and see if we have something growing on our land that they might not have. And maybe they have something that we don't have. And then fair exchange, no robbery, right? So that's the extension of this social nature that we're talking about. We're still talking about Arabic letters, y'all, and the true depth in which they are able to go down into to bring up the real gems like plants do. Put a little teeny weeny seed in the ground and it brings up multitudes of life forms that we can live off of. So all agriculture, everywhere you find it, it depends on the sun that we've been discussing. It depends on that sun for its growth and development. The essential consonants in ikra are the qaf and ra. Together, they refer to things from behind, from the back, from behind, which progress forward. See, things from behind that progress forward. As a part of the body, cough means the back of the head where the subconscious mind resides, the subconscious mind. Ra represents the front of the face, particularly the front of the forehead, the forehead in front where consciousness resides. So cough is the subconscious mind, which brings information forward to the conscious mind. And that's probably why they were satisfied with the uh, interpretation of Ikra being read. Because in order to read, you have to bring information that's from the memory bank in the back of the head, in the subconscious mind, and you have to recall or remember, put the members back together, and then send that information forward to the conscious mind. Hmm? That's Ikra. So it is read, but like I said, it's not as a first definition. So it's anything that comes from the back forward. That's a progression. If it stays in my subconscious mind, I can't use it. But if I bring it to my conscious mind, my skills or my know-how or my ability to mitigate, uh, uh, you know, some, some uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, some emergency, yeah. You know, if my if my emergency skills don't come forward during an emergency, then what good am I in that situation, right? But if I'm if I'm an emergency medic or an emergency worker, and I see an accident on the highway or something, and I, I have my bag and my bandages and all of that, with, well, now all of my skills that I have waiting in the bank, the me the memory bank, the subconscious mind, I'm able to call those skills forward and do the do. And, and help somebody, maybe save somebody's life. Isn't that wonderful? So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about ikra. Much more important than just sitting down and reading a book that you may not be attention, paying attention to as you read. Now, together, they refer to things from behind which progress forward. The human being's social life begins in antiquity. See, that's what we mean by behind you in history. Those things that were existing in history, such as the hunter-gatherer period that we were speaking about, that hunter-gatherer period has now advanced itself forward 
Mm -hmm. We call it human social progress, right? And it is responsible for developing what is now known as the socially integrated personality. What does that mean? It means that when we come out of our house now, let's say I'm from Nigeria and let's say you're from Guatemala and you don't look in your features like my people look, you don't look in your clothes like my people look, you don't sound in your language like what I'm used to hearing as language and I'm meeting you for the first time, that can be kind of shocking. Especially if I'm only used to seeing people who look and act and speak and sound and dance and talk and laugh like me. I see somebody doing something almost totally different. Man, Oh, wait a minute. Pause for pause. I need to see what this is. I got to see first if it's a real human. Because there's some gorillas walking around looking at something like this. <laughs> what people used to say to themselves. You know, there are some animals that I might be mistaking, uh, you know, for human. If I don't take a closer look at what this thing might be. I'm not understanding the lingo. So I got to go slow with this one. Again, those are prompts that Allah put in place for the development of the social nature. To encourage the, the social nature to come out. Allah says, I did not create you as uh, nations and tribes that you might, uh, you know, poo-poo each other, you know, eh, eh, who are they? You know, oh, I'm scared of them. No, it's not why he created us. He said he did it so that we might acknowledge each other, to arafu, to arafu, that we might become more, uh, better introduced to people, at least the surface of what we were seeing. And it's the surface of what you're seeing that actually encourages the curiosity in your brain. The fact that they are wearing something different or speaking something different or uh, saying something different. That's what brings the curiosity out. Oh, what, what, what is this we have here? What is that food? I, I'm not familiar with that. They look like they're enjoying it. Can I have some of that? Okay. It's the curiosity that encourages the social life the social evolving and the social development and expansion of your social concerns. Now I got to be extra nice to these people if I want some more of that good fruit they just gave me that I can't find back where I'm at. See, this is a plan. It's a divine plan that the source creator, creator has instituted that is responsible for helping us to develop into social avenues of exploration and excellence is the point. Is, is this mm -hmm. 4913? Tell me what it says. I've made you nations and tribes not to despise each other, but to learn from each other. That's correct. Except take out the part that says not to despise each other. That's uh, the author. Oh, yeah, you did say that. Uh, yes. Yeah, that's the uh, the interpreters or the translators uh, edition. edition. Okay. But it's not Allah saying it. Okay. Shukran. Give us that, give us that uh, surah and ayat again so people can write that down and spell it and study it. Hadeep. I had it on 49, 13. 13, you said? Yes, sir. 49, okay. 13. 49, 13. In fact, I'll put it here in the notes. And uh, I'm going to send you the notes also. If you attended today's class, 49, 13. 13. So you know to go there. All right, very good. All right. So here are some of the words in the Quran, and I'm saying all of this to prove a very serious point. And as you know, even the letter Qaf is one of the abbreviated letters, but we're going to get to that in detail in just a couple of weeks from now. Today, we're going to concentrate on this Qaf Ra. Both of those letters, I repeat, are uh, in the abbreviated letters series. Qaf stands by itself. Ra, as you know, is in the Alif Lam Ra sequencing of so-called abbreviated letters. Surah 12 is what we're discussing now, where Allah says, Alif Lam Ra. Tilke ayat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But here we're talking about the Qaf and the Ra as we find it in Ikra. And it's from these root letters, Qaf, Ra, Alif, Qara, A, Qara, A. Look at what it means to recite, to read. Hey, instructor, I thought you started taking me to read. <laughs> That's what I said. You can listen to what he says or you can listen to what I say. I'm telling you, this came later to make you think that Ikra means read because they were trying to establish a point. 
Yeah, they were trying to sell a whole lot of Qurans. <laughs> they said, read, this is what this means. Now, if you don't have a Quran, you can't read, can you, partner? No, okay, come to us. We got the best Qurans. We got the best translators. We got the best uh, scholars, you know, commentary, you know. But that's not what it means. It means to collect. See, collection. They snuck it in there. See, compilation. Uh, but collection. Hmm? Another one will say gathering. It means to gather. Qara'ah means to gather. Because you have to collect and gather letters in order to read words and sentences. So it makes sense on that level. Yes, but that's not the first reading is my point. This is speaking to an agricultural idea. Now, you might say, well, you mean to tell me that Allah revealed the last revelation for all time just to tell people to harvest their crops? No. The harvesting of the crops is the template for what Allah was asking them to do. The, remember, templates are in the Quran. Not necessarily actual actions or places or even people, but they are actually templates that Allah is establishing in the language so that you will study the template in order to arrive at the bigger and broader meaning. So what is the bigger and broader meaning for harvesting as the farmers do? If you're looking at knowledge, which is what was being revealed from on high to Muhammad, then you're talking about the harvesting of the signals or the signatures or the frequencies that Allah was delivering down upon Muhammad called Anzala, Anzala al-Quran. He rained down the Quran upon the heart of Muhammad. So these are frequencies. So why is Allah giving them in agricultural terms? Because in order for you to understand how to best utilize the frequencies, you have to study agricultural language and then apply the logic of that language to the frequency. So in other words, frequencies then are to be treated as crops. Frequencies then, and the messages that are inherent in those frequencies, that are sending messages to the brain and messages to the heart and messages to the nervous system, see? You have to treat them exactly as you would treat your plant kingdom, your vegetable kingdom. You have to understand that inherent in those frequencies are seeds. And those seeds need to have an environment for growth called the soil. And the soil has to have a particular conditioning that includes water, sunlight, and oxygen. We're talking about everything in you is a frequency. Your brain waves operate as frequency signatures. Alpha, beta, gamma, so forth and so forth, delta, so forth, right? Your brain, your very mind operates based on these frequencies. So if you don't know how to culture the frequencies, then the frequencies become what the vegetation becomes when you don't know how to cultivate culture and take advantage of its harvest. The vegetation becomes what in farmer terminology is called retarded. So if you've been purposely kept away from the understanding of human frequencies and how they operate inside of you, then you have been purposely manipulated to become a society and albeit a, a world of retarded people. And we're not talking clinical retardation now. We're talking psychological. As far as your frequency modulation goes, you have been created as a retarded person from birth all of the way up to death. And you have not truly lived what we would call a truly human life. That's most people on this earth. They don't live truly human lives. They live the lives that are practically the same, if not even lower level than the average animal. I'm talking about the, the, the person. If it's not you doing that to yourself or with yourself, then it's the people you live around on the most part. The average one around, it has nothing to do with whether they're a good or bad person. It has to do with whether or not they are operating in the world in the way that Allah would ask them to operate and evolve. And if they're not, then they are dying 
upon the same platform as the dog and the gorilla and the parrot, parakeet, the cat, the lion, the bird. You're not living any higher form of life than those animals, those common animals. They stand a better chance of going to Jannah than you do because Allah didn't give them brains to be able to map out their life. He gave them instinctive drive to do what their instincts demanded that they do. Allah gave you instincts, but he gave you emotions and intellect on top of that. And you chose to live, to live the life of those who just live on a level of instinct and emotion. And you said, well, it's brain. I just, you know, use that later. You know, right now, I just want what feels good. You know, I want to do the dance that feels good. I want to eat the stuff that's sweet, <laughs> that I like, tastes good. You know, but your intelligence is not regulating that. So you're living on a level, I repeat, lower than the average animal. I hope everybody's understanding what I'm saying. This is deep, 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 deep science that I'm sharing with you right now. So look at these words. That, yes. Yeah, so you mind. So we're dealing with metaphor, compared and contrasting, right? Yeah. You got it. Metaphors and contrast and metaphysics in terms of the understanding. So let's look at these few words that have kaf ra attached to them. We started with kaf ra alif, which gives us ikra. We go on to kaf ra ba, araba which means to be near to. I'm not going to read all of this, but it means to be in proximity. Look, it means kindred. So that's other people other than just you, right? And it goes on and on and on. Cause to draw nigh, to draw near, et cetera, et cetera. This word is all throughout the Quran. So what am I trying to show you and showing you all of these kafara words? I'm showing you that kafara always has to do with the social life. It always has to do with the social nature. There's no reason to be an agriculturalist or a farmer if your intent is just to feed yourself. You can just pick from the stuff that Allah allowed the seeds to blow into, into the field and grow an orange tree, an apple tree. You didn't have to plant that necessarily. Or you can feed off of a bush that you didn't plant. It was out there when you got there. If you're just attempting to feed you, but now if you're attempting to feed your family, your extended family, and families on the other side of the hill or across the river, now you have to come up with a more sophisticated means of sharing on a social level what your harvest is bringing in. Maybe you can even sell some of it to make a profit because it's your harvest, see? So the very idea of the kafra is saying that I have to be in proximity to other people. I have to exercise my social nature, is the point. See? Even if you're reading, literally, out loud, like your teacher in second grade or whatever, third grade used to ask you to do, that's a social event. Why would you read to yourself? You can. And you do when you're first learning how to read. But let's say now you're 23 years old, or you're 55 years old, you're 78 years old, and you're, you're reading a book. Most people don't read the book out loud. <laughs> because that kind of reading, what they call reciting, is for other people to hear. You're standing in the mandatory ritual salat, and you're reading the Quran as the imam in front of the line, you're reading it not so you can hear it. You're reading it so the people back there who might not know it can read it or hear it and learn it. So reading is a social event. See? Ikra. Ka ra. See? Ka ra is always social, is the point. Go down to this next one. Kafra sheen to cut off, curtail, he gained, earned, acquired, and collected. You see the idea of collecting? For who? For himself? No. For his family. See, social. It means big fish. And you know, fish swim in what they call schools. So fish are some of the most social creatures you're going to find in, fit, in the fitrah. And it's the name of an Arab tribe descended from Ibrahim, of which Muhammad's grandfather was the chief. We're talking about the tribe called Quraysh. Hmm? All right, Quraysh, and they were a social group. The tribe wasn't an individual called Quraysh, it was a tribe, the social nature. 
Look at the next word, yeah, to entertain a guest. Isn't that social? See, to explore, investigate with a much diligent search, but look at the last meaning here. City, town, isn't that social? So following this logic to its logical conclusion, the son of social logic follows the exact same fitra pattern as the sun, which rises, pinnacles, and sets, creating our 24-hour day. We're talking about psychology now. And we're talking about the son of social logic, which follows a fitra pattern. Every day that the sun rises from the east, pinnacles in the north, and then begins to set in the west. The sun of social logic does exactly the same thing throughout societies, cities, towns, communities that follow a particular social logic, whether that logic is communism, socialism, capitalism, whatever that logic is or has been named, it cannot escape the pattern, the fitra pattern of presenting itself, rising, pinnacling, becoming its strongest force or influence in the world or in its area, and then eventually dissipating and disappearing. So the establishment of social logic also has its beginning stage. In English, we call it dawn. In the Quran, it's called the fajr. It has its middle stage. We call it noon. The Quran calls it zuhr. And it has its ending stage, which is the sun's decline, called the asr. Awesome. Let me put this where it really belongs here. So I know you've heard these words as uh, words pertaining to the ritual prayer. And you can put that in your back pocket. Hold on to that. But I'm telling you that in the Quran, these words are not treated as such. You've seen the word Fajr in other parts of the Quran. Can anyone name a, a verse in the Quran that carries the word Fajr or some variation of it, like Fujur or something like that? Off of the top of your head, can you think of somewhere in the Quran that carries that word? I don't remember the exact um, number of the surah, but uh, it, it recites, uh, Am I? No, I'm not thinking. No, 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 no. Back up. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> you came close, but you were thinking of Felak. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. How about, yeah. how about, how about the token of time? <laughs> Say that again? By the token of time. No, that's Asr. We're looking, we're looking for Fajr, but you're right about Asr. We're talking about Fajr. Layla to Qadr. Yes. What does it say? Layla to Qadr. Fisher. It's in the last ayah. even if you only know it in English. You ready? Can I, I'm waiting. Do you want me to say something? I'll say something. Say yeah. something. Help me out. Okay. Uh, peace, this until the rise of, of morn. Yes. And which word? Fajr. Okay, let me straighten that up a little bit for you. Please do. Salamun kia hatta metlail fajr. That's right. Peace it is until the rise of morn or dawn or fajr. So obviously that has nothing to do with the ritual prayer right there, does it? Yeah. All right. And it's given in other places that can be interpreted as 
uh, a particular ritual during a particular time of day. We're not arguing with that right now. We're just trying to establish a logic for the term itself. And uh, in the surah called the, the, um, the sun, as shams. Oh, it's, see, it's, see, see, you, you didn't okay. get it. Go, go right ahead. Wait, wait a minute. Jump in. This is double dutch. Jump right in. This is, uh, uh, man, I, I know it's, wait a minute. Oh, man, I now you can't it. jump in and then your sneakers freeze. You know what, man? Okay, <laughs> wait a minute. Your sneakers get stuck to the <laughs> it, ground. It says, uh, to, what does it uh, say? What nef sin wa ma sa wa ha fa la la ha fa juro ha wa takro ha. It got fa juro. Yeah. It's a light give, give, and it's wrong. Give us the English. Right. Give us the English. Again, and, and it's enlightenment as to what's mm -hmm. wrong and to what's right. Okay, so what is the word that's been used for fujur or fujuriha? Fujuriha. Wrong. That's right. Now, how do we get from fajr? How is that associated with being wrong? That's why I'm. That's why I'm your student. <laughs> I don't know. Well, that's why I'm W. D. Muhammad's student. Because <laughs> he what you say? he he explained it. I said that's why I'm Imam Muhammad's student because he explained know. it. He explained it for all of us. So let, pay attention, and then that will be the conclusion of today's class, and we'll have to pick okay. up here next week. Many among the Arabic linguists have translated fujur as being evil and wrong, like wrong behavior. And Imam Muhammad said on several occasions that it has nothing to do with your moral nature as such in that you're making conscious decisions to do something evil or wrong or injurious or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. It's pointing, if you study the fitra of what the word is suggesting, as Fajr is the beginning light of the new day sun, that beginning light begins to penetrate the darkness, even in areas of forestry, where you're in the middle of, a, of the woods, you're still going to begin to see remnants of that light shine through the branches and so forth as the sun begins to uh, make its uh, way up to presenting its whole picture to society. So when you're hardly in the light and still mostly in the dark, that's fujur. Fujur. Remember, I told you also that the elongated dhumma sound in u represents a spiritual quality, which means that your rational mind is not going to be able to uh, assess it and understand it. It's something that's taking place on the deep spiritual level. Fujur. Just like uh, Nujum, the, the stars. Oh, no, not the stars, but the, uh, let's get a better. Buruj, El Buruj, the zodiac. <laughs> Allah gives it that same elongated dhumma sound. Oh, Buruj, because it's spiritual. Even in English, when we try to talk about something ghostly or spiritual, <laughs> we use the term boo, <laughs> try to scare somebody, right? Boo, or you know, we're trying to say that we know something about somebody that uh, nobody else knows. We got some deep insight. We go, ooh, wait, children do this. You got to study children and their fitra. They go, ooh, and their next words are, I'm a tell, because they know something now that they think nobody else knows. That's called spiritual. That's that's deeper than just rational. That's spiritual. I know it, and I'm going to share it now. See. That's spiritual. So Fujur represents a level of sunrise, the, the beginning of sunrise that still has the majority of the earth in mostly darkness. Oh. So it's not evil. It's when society is beginning to experience the first incremental levels and increase of logic, how to live oh, logically. Okay. Huh? The breaking of God. It's called the breaking of God. Yeah, they call it the break. Breaking. Yeah, that's a good term, break. You know, the word break. Not quite, not quite there. 
Well, it still interchanges with the letters in Faja. Can anybody do that for me? I can. The back yeah. is, is a hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's take the three level, the three uh, um, word, the three letters, pardon me, in uh, Fajr. Okay, wait a minute. And Fajr. all right, mm -hmm. I'm putting them on the sheet here. Oh, all right, and then you give me the ones in break. Okay, what three letters back is a lip for the back, back, mm hmm, mm hmm, uh, uh. K. Well, give them to me in order for break. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Abdul, give it to R. Me. Give me the last one. Yep. And K. Okay. Now give me how they interchange. Now these are two different languages, audience. Yes, and I'm going to show you how phonetics applies no matter what the language. Go. The fat in the back is a lip. That's right. Labials. And, right. And fat and back. That's right. And the, uh, the gene and the cat and the calf is uh, uh, interchangeable with this with that what, with the, what do you call those from the back of the throat? What do you call those? Gutturals. Gutturals. Gutturals, yeah. Gutturals, yes. Gutturals. Gutturals. And the R, the R is evident, it's, right? Is is R, yes. And what do you call that in the mouth? The liquid. It's a liquid. <laughs> That's right. Y'all got it. Y'all got this. Okay. So Fajr and break share consonantal connections. I'll go a little step further. Somebody mentioned Felak. That was Habiba. Right? Let's see if this logic applies. <laughs> Does it apply? Yeah. Show me the connections. Let Habiba do it. Yeah. S, the S is fa. Yeah. Uh, the L, is, it is, it corresponds with the R. Yeah. And the Q, the, the, the cough, corresponds with the, the cough. <laughs> no, 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 no. Go, uh, stay with Faji. What does that Fajr? cough interchange with? Yeah. With the J. That's right. The As what? What is it called in the mouth? J. Uh, those, in the mouth? That's those are the gutturals. Okay, that's that right. that would be yeah, the 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 uh labials, the uh the R and the L are yeah. the liquids and the gene and the uh my head's going everywhere. Okay, All the, right. the gene yeah, you're, you're right on point. The guttural, you were doing well. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're right on point. Right on point. I appreciate you. Okay. So this is to show you that this is not guesswork. What Allah has given us as the science of nunetics is on point and it's on time. And it is what is going to be drawing thousands of people our way in just a little bit of time. I just got another call from a, a dear and sincere father of two children who wants me to teach their child like I'm teaching Mahdi and I'm like I'm teaching Judas the daughters. All right. So I put Thursday aside for him and his children. He said, well, I don't just want it for my two daughters. He said, I want it for myself also. So he he, he paid for an extra hour. <laughs> he said, give me my daughters one hour. My children, I, I'm not sure if they're both. No, I think they're two sons. Yeah. And I want an hour for myself. See? So that's how they're doing. I told you they were going to start doing that, didn't I? Yeah. Yep. All right. And I believe he, you know, he's from some other ethnic group. Alhamdulillah, maybe Pakistani or some other Muslim ethnic group. But that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. The humans. Where are, the, where are the true humans at? Right. That's right. See? So that's going to start happening. And those of you who need to bone up, you, mostly you don't need to do it because you have these classes here. You know, you really don't need any more than what I've been giving you so far. But if you have uh, family members or, you know, the Muslims in the masjid who could benefit from this, I'm supposed to be hearing, you're supposed to be giving me at least two names a week to say, hey, this person is interested in learning these uh, abbreviated letters, at least, if they're not interested in the whole class. So you got to get on yours now. I'm putting a little pressure on y'all because I'm keep trying no to tell problem. you what's getting what's getting no ready problem. to happen. I can't believe y'all don't know nobody. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to believe that one. Y'all are some of the most popular people in your in your towns. Forget the master. All right, so get to working. Get to working.
we're going to leave off on there. There's a lot more that I wanted to say today that I just don't have time to say because I go slow enough so that you'll get it. And when you get the replay, you'll be able to study it without it being crammed into your brain. I want this to be a smooth and comfortable experience for you. This is designed to put you at the front of the line, trust me, in terms of scholarship I'm talking about. Not just in your, uh, in your university online learning course class. That I ain't just talking about the class. This is designed to put you in the front. If you, you just wait till people hear what you're doing in this class <laughs> that you might not be paying attention to because you're used to it now. When I ask a question and you give me those quick answers and you're right the first time, that's what I've been waiting for. And that's what you're giving me back now. That's what I'm appreciating about you. Okay. So let's get this thing rolling. This year, I've been predicting, and I'm no prophet or nothing crazy like that, but I've been predicting that this year, you're going to see tremendous numbers come into this Nunetics study. And they ain't all coming through the UOLC. That's not how they come. They're coming like the people came into Al-Islam in the time of the prophet before he passed. And Allah says, When comes the help of Allah and the victory? And then the people began coming into the deen of Islam, the deen of Al-Islam, in crowds. That's what I'm talking about is about to happen. And it's going to happen all over the world with anybody who's teaching pure fitra-based Al-Islam. It ain't going to happen for those people who are teaching old Persian version Islam or ethnic out of superiority centered Islam. It ain't going to happen for them. Their thing is dying on the vine, withering and dying on the vine as we speak with no chance of resuscitation. It's just going to die. It's meant to die because it has not maintained its connection to fitra-based logic. It no. went into scholarship-based logic. And scholarship-based logic is faulty. From the beginning of it, it's faulty. Doesn't mean it's bad intentioned. It can be good intentioned and still be faulty. Muslims were struggling in history to maintain the integrity of their mm -hmm. position as Muslims in the world, amongst other people who said other things and did other things and believed other things. So Muslims did their best, and sometimes their best was to fabricate in order to make it seem like mine is as good as yours. My daddy can beat your daddy. They were going through that for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So the Christians had a Jesus Christ. We had to make Muhammad our Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The Jews had a, a, an only chosen people the fabrication concept. We're the only chosen people of God. You got to be born through a Jewish mother's womb to be uh, 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 one of God's chosen people. Muslims did the same thing. You have to take shahada in order to be saved. That's not from the Quran. That's from the mm -hmm. scholars. Mm -hmm. okay? Jesus Christ died for your sins. You got to come here and take shahada and have all your sins forgiven. Mm -hmm. Just all you got to do is take shahada and everything you did that was wrong and you don't even know most of it, it's still going to be wiped off your <laughs> slate by God. And, and, and just in case you fell back off the wagon, <laughs> you sinner you, <laughs> then we got, mm -hmm. we got the Ramadan. <laughs> if you fast mm -hmm. Ramadan successfully, all your sins will be erased. Mm -hmm. And since you don't know whether they were all erased during Ramadan, we got Hajj. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, you go, if you go to Hajj and you have a successful Hajj, Allah wipes it clean like your newborn baby, right? So they keep giving us these intervals of sin uh, redemption. But where did they get that? Mm. They got that from the number one purveyors of sin religion, and that's the Christians. Mm -hmm. Everything's mm. a sin. Mm -hmm. So you so busy, you so busy trying to cover up for sin that you don't get a chance to exercise excellence because you're scared to do stuff. You're scared to say stuff. You're scared to investigate and study stuff because you think everything is a sin. Oh. You're listening to that instructor Bilal guy. Yeah, oh man, he's just Quran. wasting your time. You need to just be in the Quran and the Sunnah, brother. The Quran and the Hadith. And they think anything outside of Quran and Hadith is, is sin. Really? And there were no Quran and no Hadith in Muhammad's time. Not as you know them. So get on the good foot. 
All right. Let's keep this train moving down the track. It's going somewhere. Any last minute questions before I close out? When you when you said Nezala, you know, from 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 our teaching is the word nozzle, which mm -hmm. rains down on the soil of the, the seed that was planted in the in the ground, the humid soil. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and that English word, and, yeah. And what we say, like we said that. Knowledge which does not feed the life of the intellect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Let me catch up with you. You're moving down the track kind of fast for me. Okay. There you go. All right. So Nazala means to rain down or to reveal. Allah speaks about the Quran. He doesn't speak about hadiths as being rained down from a divine source. But the English speaking world, curiously enough, has this word nozzle, which allows you to actually control the pressure and the amount of the water that comes out of the holes, right? The nozzle does that. And what right. does Allah say in the Quran? Allah says that in some cases, he sends down torrential rains, downpours. He said, and in other cases, light moisture will mm -hmm. suffice. See, so everybody doesn't need what you're getting in Nunetics and in the Sunday class, Sunday evening class. Everybody don't need that level. That's for people who have been dead for a very long time and for many generations. That's us, <laughs> Black folk. We've been dead so long. Man, we need as much as we need downpour. I'll just keep, just let it soak into the soil of our souls now. We need it. But other people who have been in this thing for generations, they don't need this kind of intensity. They only need me to tell them about pneumatics, what the letters mean. And then they got they got surahs and ayat running through their brains. They don't even have to go to a physical book. And they can start making connections in their own head as I'm speaking. They don't need to hear about African-American history. They don't need to hear about Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. They don't really even need to hear about W.D. Muhammad. You might think they do, but even W.D. Muhammad thought that they didn't. He said, you don't have to say nothing about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would you give us the number so we could number you want us to to give to the people to 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 about the uh, the letters? What do you mean? Them to come to the to the class? No, I don't want them to come to the class. Not this our class. Where where would I tell them to call to get information to to, to about the uh, the alphabets? Oh, you tell them to go on YouTube. That's why I put those couple of classes up there to whet their appetite. And then they'll tell do... them to go on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, tell them to go on YouTube and look up abbreviated letters. Imam e e Benjamin Bilal. Hold on. Okay. Imam e Benjamin Bilal. And then just look, just type in abbreviated letters. That's what all of them are named. I already took one off. I told you it was only going to be up till the 28th of February. I took that one down already. So if they don't hurry up and catch that last one that's up there, they won't get it. But they don't need that. They can go to my these classes where I'm teaching letters. He got 20 something classes on YouTube. They don't have to come to us live. Just let them go to Mahdi's classes. And in fact, that's what this gentleman said he, he was doing. He said, that's how he found me. He was looking at Mahdi. He said he started from his first class and then Mahdi, he's 20 something deep now, I think almost into the 20, 20th class. And okay. I'm doing nothing but doing. letters with Mahdi. So take them there, take them to what I already have. Mm. You don't have to bring them to nothing new. You don't have to, bring, you don't have to tell them about Sunday classes and all of okay. that. That's, that's what I for want. our, Just that's for our soil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do it like that. Well, yeah. Before you leave, you mentioned the the the, the drench when when it all pours down. Yes, we could also look at the flood. What happened during the flood? Noah flood. Is that right? Explain the more. The point of water. The Noah's flood. Like people were so deprived of. Well, I guess more rules and you know deprivation. They needed the more. They needed the. They needed the. Um, I guess you would say. Um, they needed to be enlightened more, and we always compare with uh, water with cleanliness, uh, morals. Mm -hmm. So I guess that right there, um, you know, when you're deprived, you need some. You need you need some purification, going to to go on. Yeah. It represents all of that. Yeah, to continue to, 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 to um, cleanse you. 
Yeah. Not for sure. moisture. Yeah. So when you get these words, as Abdul is doing, and many of you do already, Bayina especially, then you begin to look these words up in your dictionaries, your thesauruses, your lexicons, your encyclopedias, your wikipedias. You look up the word water or you Google the question, you know, what is water? If you know I'm speaking about a letter that means water, or if you know I'm speaking about, um, you know, whatever other word, I'm giving them to you in just ones and twos and threes right now, you know. Um, look up what that thing is, and you're going to see how special this creation is that Allah has created. And I think water is probably, well, it's it's one of the only elements that can be used internally as well as externally. Mm -hmm. What about am I, air? Am, am I correct? No, what about it, air? It, it, well, that's why I said one of. Mm -hmm. But air, air, if you look at it as uh, oxygen, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what but there's is more, there's, there, pardon me? Allah said the basic element of life. I'm not hearing you breaking up. I said Allah says that that water is the basic element of life. Well, what he says is not that it's the basic element of life in those words, but he says that he created all living things from water. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit different. See, what Allah is doing is giving equality to all of the four basic elements. He's not mm -hmm. elevating any one above the other. Mm -hmm. Because if you take away water, you die. Mm -hmm. When you take okay. away air, you'll still die. It'd just be a different frame of time. <laughs> right. I think, what is it, like six to eight minutes without air, without oxygen? You, you're out of here. Right. But you can you can fast from water for maybe a couple of days, you know, before you start deteriorating right. or withering, right? So, and then if you take away the fire of the sun, how long are you going to live without that warmth and that heat and those vitamins, see? Mm -hmm. And of course, yeah. if you take away the land, you're out of here. So each one mm -hmm. of them have their contribution and um, their importance in our lives. And when you understand them on the metaphorical or the metaphysical level that I've been presenting them, when you understand what water is as uh, emotion or what air is as spirit or what fire is as the intellect or what the land is as your material concerns, you'll also learn that you can't do without any one of those four. You see how that goes? H A M D, right? It's also in that word, yeah. Hamd, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, the heat, the air, the fire, and the land. It's in that word. That's right. Y'all are getting mm -hmm. this. I'm appreciating y'all a whole lot right now because I, I know you're studying. Okay. Instructor. So, um, Sorry. Yes. Go right ahead. Also, in. Mm -hmm. um, I've been on, on the second time reading the hidden messages. I think you've mentioned that before, the hidden messages in water. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, by Masaru Emoto. Emoto, yeah. All Act of you should have that book. Definitely. The hidden messages, he's got about two or three of them out with the word uh, water in them. But his first one was the hidden messages in water. Yeah, he said when he, when he did certain things, if he said a curse word, and then and then and then put it in there and it was frozen or or uh uh, uh something that was uh helpful put in there that crystals look different. Well so let me let me let me have Sophia explain more of what is said in that book. Um he's actually saying that he's showing that the frequency of our words have an effect on water and on on everything. There you go. So if you do rice, the bowl of rice experiment where you write love on one bowl of rice and fool on the other bowl of rice, the one with fool would rot faster than the one with love. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there were a few experiments like and that's that. rice and water was, correct rice in water I think it was even just I, I'm not sure I thought yeah, it was I believe it was rice. rice okay it could be whatever the case is I know it has to have water somewhere in the equation either cooked rice yeah. or rice uh, being soaked in water or something like that yeah yes he also yeah. talked about you know how everything vibrates and how um, like aluminum vibrates at it's um, it's sad, so it's, it vibrates as um, sadness. So all these different um, metals and chemicals and things, they all vibrate. And so we also have to be aware of that. <laughs> That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. But so it's an now, excellent book. I think everybody should, all of us. It's should, mandatory. Should go through that book, yes. That book is a mandatory part of our reading. If you're going to do anything that has to do with nunetics, you have to read that book. I would just like to say that Iman Wardi Muhammad said that words make people, and most of our body is made up out of water. So just imagine what's happening to the makeup of our young people when the rappers are saying what kind of terrible, horrible curse words. That's right. Mm, That's right. You, you got it. Yeah. It's affecting their frequencies. In our garden mm. class, we can play, well, if you have music, you can play rock music because that has an effect on the um, plants, of course. So we got to mm -hmm. play you know, decent music or good, if anybody plays music, but. Yeah, they've had, they've, they've had plants, they've played rock music, hard rock music through the speakers in front of plants. And they have watched the plants literally move away from the speakers. They bent mm -hmm. away, they couldn't escape because they're in the soil. But they actually okay. bent away from the music. And then they played, yeah. you know, Tchaikovsky or whoever the great, you know, orchestrating uh, leaders are. And they play their music and the, the, the plants lean toward the speakers. You see how that right. goes? All right. Yeah, right. So yeah. if they're doing that and the plants, as you know, are being regulated by water. And um, as Bayina just said that uh, I think it's between 75 and 85 percent, depending on how old you are of your body is actually composed of water, water mm -hmm. molecules and water in the blood, especially, which we're going to talk about more in the seven o'clock class. So it'll be like an extension of, of what we're doing today. If you understand that, then you can understand the real damage that you're doing when you saturate yourself with those low level frequencies of music and lyrics and cussing and fussing and all of that. And just looking at stupid stuff on television and in the videos and you're on YouTube all day long looking at nonsense. All of that is affecting your body, your very mm -hmm. body's molecules, your water molecules are being oh. dumbed down, turned off mm -hmm. and being made inferior. See, mm -hmm. so you have to keep mm -hmm. these things in mind. I'm saying these things to y'all, not because it's y'all that's doing it, but you know, people in your family, your children, your grandchildren, mm -hmm. your duty as a Muslim is to at least present it in clear language that they're doing that damage. Even if you have to use a third person as an example, you understand? You don't have to tell them this is what you're doing, grandchild. <laughs> Because you hear them we're listening to this strange music and this cussing and fussing and their favorite artist is the most vile of all of them. Just use a third person as an example. That's all. And in fact, you can, you can actually point out certain hip hop artists who have died very tragic, tragically in the last decade. And say, well, look at, how, look at how these guys are going out. These guys are being killed off. Most hip hop, these young hip hop artists, they're dying tragic deaths. Why is that? Because their frequencies are magnetizing that level of activity in their direction. It's a science. That's what I'm trying to introduce all of you to. That really, literally, what happens to you on the most part in your life is as a result of what you're calling forth. You don't see it that way because you think you're just plain innocent. You are innocent, yeah. but nature. I said this in my nature versus nurture videos. Nature is what? Neutral. Nick, listen to me again before I close out. Go back and listen to my videos on YouTube. Nature versus nurture. I think there are three parts to that lecture. I told you nature 
is neutral. Look at those consonants. Nature is neutral. You know what that means? Nature could care less what you do to yourself. Nature, Nature has awesome. certain instructions from Allah to allow whatever you're asking for to be sent to you. If you go up on the highest mountain or off the tallest building and you decide that's your day to end it all, nature will not stop you. There will be no fuzzy, comfy cloud that comes along and it intercepts your fall. That's all I'm saying. Nature is designed to be neutral. It's your, it's your agent. It's actually an angel working for you. It gives up its resources and its services to you, but it doesn't work on your behalf until you align that frequency and those services that the angels are waiting to render you. You have to align those frequencies with Allah, not with your own individual ego and all the rest of that stuff. If you align it with the wrong frequency, you're going to get the wrong result. If you align it with the correct frequency, which is Allah's frequency, the source creator's frequency, you're going to get the right result every time, even though you'll have challenges along the road. Just like when you're driving, you get to where you're going, but you got to weave out of the way of the speedster and, you know, that kind of thing. The, 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 the road kill, you know, you got to get around all of that, but you're going to get to your destination. It's the same thing. The word Allah gives the English world their word called allow. I've told you this. I put it in my books. A-L-L-O-W is just another way of saying A-L-L-A-H. Because Allah is the one who allows. What do you mean he allows, instructor? Just what I told you. You want to go jump off a bridge? Go ahead and see what happens. He's going to allow you to do that. You want to get your life in order and become an excellent human being? Allah also allows for that. And his favor is with that. His disfavor is with you doing the thing that's going to ruin you, although he'll allow you to do it. That's the difference between what one person called today the will of Allah and the permission of Allah. You see the difference? There's some things your parents will permit you to do that they don't like you doing, but they, 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 they let it happen. They permit you to bring home that strange looking teenager from your seventh grade class but they don't like it. And it's not the, if, they, if you said, mom, I'd like to bring someone home, what kind of personality would you like to see from my friends? She'd tell you, Eva, you know, I saw Johnny, he looks like a very decent boy, comes to school in a necktie, you know, white shirt and all that. Bring Johnny, that's her will. Now, if you bring raggedy ass Bob, who looked like he ain't combed his hair in two years, no washed his face in three years, and his clothes are smelly and hanging out the side, you know, his pants out, his shirt hanging outside his pants and his sneakers are, you understand what I'm saying? And he comes in the house, I'm like, yo, what's up, moms? That guy, if she lets him in the house, <laughs> it's just her by her permission. Because she know you're going she know you're gonna find a way to try to do it anyway, right? So she said, Well, let me just check him out. Maybe I can improve upon his <laughs> adab, you know. So there's a difference. Allah is in control of both his will and what he lets happen by his permission. But he's given us the intellectual tools to be able to navigate those waters for ourselves and get the result that we're looking for it's through conscious intervention and application of these actions. See, we have that control. It's the beautiful thing that I'm trying to reinforce. We have that control. It's not in the hands of anybody else, not even of the social schemers. Allah says that Satan's only power is to suggest, to whisper suggestions. But he calls and we come of our own will. That's why you get punished. Would you think Allah would punish you for something that you had no control over? That wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be fair. That wouldn't be just. The only reason human beings get punished by Allah is because you had the ability to avert go in a different direction and you didn't because you thought you had something waiting for you at the end of your evil thing or your wrong thing or your sin or whatever. You thought there was something there that you could grab real quick and then go repent like those other religions teach you to do. I'll just wait till Friday and go to Juma. I'll be straight if I make you get them rock odds in. What, what, what guarantees you're going to make it to Friday? 
you say, I'll wait till Saturday. I'll go to the synagogue and I'll tell the rabbi, you know, whatever. Or I'm so arrogant that I don't need to repent. <laughs> yeah, you got some people in the world like that. They're just, so arrogant. They think they don't need to repent. Instructor. Yes. I just went to a gymnasium. Yeah. Right. And, and this was an elderly sister that passed. But while we were there at the cemetery, there was another little girl that was like six years old. And she was oh. at Juma. She was at Juma on Friday. And she passed uh, right after that. And, yeah. and so what, what you're saying is absolutely right. You know, Goes to show how, you. how do you know? You're, yeah. How do you know? Yeah. You're going to have time. Man, and time listen, folks, you. on a different note, I don't know that little girl, and I, I pray that Allah, uh, in fact, I know that Allah has accepted her into his Jannah, especially at that age. So I don't have any questions about that. But I do have questions about the numbers of young people who are dying after having received the COVID shot or jab, whatever they're calling it. So unless your child or grandchild has some really mitigating circumstances, medically speaking, I'd keep them away from any additional boosters or whatever that they, because they're about to introduce, they just trying to figure out how to do it against the uh, push back of people who are waking up every day to their schemes. They haven't figured out how to do it and put it in the public so that those people who are against it can't develop enough momentum against doing this next thing. So they have to make whatever this next thing is, they have to make it spectacular. Like something has to attack you that you know only God could put on you. They tried to do it with this one by saying it was in the air. That means only God is putting it on you. We don't control the air. We can only tell you protect yourself against the air. And in doing so, you're reducing the level of oxygen that you are getting. With your 70-year-old and 80-year-old self and grand self and whatever, you know, here you are. I don't understand. Why would you believe Bill Gates and Fauci at the beginning of the pandemic, scandemic, pandemic, when they said you need to wear these masks? Everybody said because Fauci said, he's the head of the NIH, and because Bill Gates said, and he couldn't get a virus out of his computer, but he gonna get it out of you. Anyway, because they said, where man? everybody went and bought up all the masks. I want y'all to follow this so-called logic. We're talking about social oh. logic today. Everybody went out and got double masked and all of that and got all kinds of uh, squirt, 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 disinfectant, squirt, 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 squirt. The people became multi-billionaires in those couple of years. The people who make the masks and the people who sell the whatever you call that squirt, squirt stuff that they encourage you that you don't even know what's in that stuff that's going in, that's being saturated into your skin. Yeah, all of that. You don't know what's in that stuff. Sanitizer. <laughs> Sanitize, yeah, 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 yeah. They're mm -hmm. trying to sanitize humanity, is what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Now, my point is this: as soon as they said wear it, we were on it. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go into places unless you were had it. Mm -hmm. But when Fauci, the same Fauci and the same Bill Gates said, mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, one of them said we were wrong. <laughs> it was never as infectious as we said it was. So Bill Gates said, yeah, and Fauci said, well, okay, it's outlived this usefulness. It's no longer necessary. How come those same people didn't hear that, that are still right now today outside your window, outside your door, wearing the mask? Still, even though their bosses said, you don't need it anymore. We don't wear it anymore. They wasn't wearing it then. You see them in the parties, hugging up on each other when they said social distancing was what we were supposed to be doing. You see them in there eating and drinking and acting a fool with each other. But they told us we needed it. But the point is, is that now that they say we don't need it, how come the spell wasn't broken from these people who are still walking around with the mask? What is it? Who told them that if, yeah, that's true for the rest of the Earth's population, except for you, grandma. You ain't talked to your grandma yet? And say, hey, your bosses said, you don't have to say it like that, but you know, your Bill Gates and Fauci, and those people in in Ray, uh, Reagan, you hear me? Uh, uh, Reagan, what's his name? What's the president? Biden. <laughs> Biden, Biden, yeah, the one who goes around the earth begging for resources. Yeah, that one. He said it was over. Mm -hmm. But the damage was done. The repeat, the repetition. 
to say it loud the damage and long is enough, done. You didn't believe it. The athletes are falling dead on the on the field, basketball mm -hmm. and football and soccer, just keeling mm -hmm. over. Mm -hmm. If that's not enough, I add for you, then something's wrong with you. I don't know what kind of instructions you need after that. If your eyes are lying to you, then I don't know what I can say or what these people can say to change your mind about the scheme that is designed to take out at least three quarters of the world's population and they ain't finished yet. And you'd be a stone cold fool to stop coming to the Sunday class because that's where your information <laughs> it's going to be let loose. And if they don't like it on YouTube, I go to somebody else's too. But we got to get this information out because this is, like I've been saying, life and death. Mm -hmm. and no the joke. FDA, the FDA, the World Health Organization, the CDC, it's not crazy if you look at their history. They got a bad track record. You're, 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 you're playing it down. When you say right. bad track record, these people are purely evil. And we're letting them rule our lives like they are small miniature gods under Allah. Like there's some pantheon happening out here when it comes to God power. So be careful. That's all I'm telling you, especially with you. If you don't care about you and your age group, uh, so be it. Maybe you didn't like it, mama. I don't know. I don't know. But your babies, you better at least be telling your children who have these children. If I were you, baby, I know they're going to offer you that shot. They'll give it to you while you're pregnant. All the babies that's been born in my family that we know about, we made sure they knew. They said, Dad, no, we know. We ain't getting no shit. They tried to encourage it all of the way along the way. And then after the baby was born, we just wanted to offer you again. No, I don't want that. Well, you know, what? when he goes to school, I'll deal with that. When that, when that gets here, I, I'll deal with that. We got grandchildren in school, seven, eight years old in that age. They ain't had it. I don't care how many other children get it. They didn't have it. I will stop their schooling and set up New Netics Institute right here in my house before I let that happen. That's how serious that is. All right. You got your marching orders. Got to go. I'll see you at seven, inshallah. Hope all of you got the link. As I greet you in peace with the greetings of peace that obligate each and every one of us to keep the peace. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum 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 alaikum